Hey everybody. Happy Sunday from uh chilly, drizzly, dreary Georgia. I was watching in the comments where everyone's dealing with polar vortex type situations and uh up to 12 inches of snow up in Indiana. I uh weirdly enough actually do miss that. I miss uh having to deal with the sm deal with the snow and having to go out and get the milk and the bread. Here it's just trying to stay warm until it turns into 73 degree weather in a couple of days, which is weird and off-putting that it does that. And I hope you're all staying uh, warm and safe. Uh, this is a, a stripped down bourbon talk tonight. Um, I wanted to talk about a few things, address a few things, um, go over what we've just experienced over the past few days. Uh, what I'm thinking about, I've had uh, a lot of thoughts about social media and um, politics and, and, and what we're dealing with right now and where we're going. So um, I hope you'll indulge me. I, uh, I think it's very cool that you came out tonight. I didn't um, send out the usual uh, invitations or links or whatever on Twitter. I'm currently taking a break from Twitter uh, for reasons that um, I'll talk about here in just a few minutes. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't start with uh, what happened in the Senate with the impeachment trial. Um, I want to say first and foremost that, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't think he was going to be convicted. Like, I think we all knew that the numbers weren't there. We knew that the Republican Party uh, wasn't going to grow their consciences, that they weren't going to, you know, suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and wonder, my God, what have I done? Um, that was that wasn't going to happen. And and and. I did not tell myself that that was going to happen. I wasn't prepared for that to happen. I do think that first and foremost, it was disappointing that he was acquitted. Obviously. I mean, the president of the United States enraged a mob for months and then um, sick them on his own vice president in the legislative branch but I think the really disturbing, awful moment was watching the Democratic Party fold like they did and fold in a way uh, that was not just shocking, but undeniably craven. That was hard. Uh, as, as a lot of you know, uh, I'm, I'm not a Democrat. I actually don't consider myself a partisan. I say all the time that I caucus with the Democrats because they are the only party that even operates with it within a sphere that resembles a reality that is real. And uh, they're the only party that aren't engaged in uh, fascistic attempts. But I do have to tell you that uh, there was still a part of me that held out hope that they would treat this as the serious matter that it was. I want to be very clear about something. Uh, we, we watched a coup attempt on January 6th. We watched the president of the United States try and overturn an election. And we watched a mob of thousands swarm the capital of the United States of America in full view of the world. And not, and again, we've talked about this before in previous uh, podcasts and discussions and, and streams or whatever. You know, we had groups of people there who were obviously not serious. We had other groups of people who were, you know, QAnon adherents. And then we had other people who were trained paramilitary white supremacists, white terrorists. They went into the Capitol looking to murder politicians, including the vice president of the United States, uh, Democratic senators, Democratic representatives. And I have to assume uh, some Republicans as well. There is a part of me, and, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight. There is a part of me that is realistic and a part of me that is idealistic. They don't often 
reach concert. Um, I'm, I, I have to admit sometimes, and this doesn't make me cool on a place like Twitter, um, I'm a little bit romantic about the idea of right and wrong and what needs to happen in order to make this country better. And it wouldn't have been hard to have called witnesses. It wouldn't have been to have figured out a strategy. But what happened was that the Democratic Party treated this like it was a charade, like it was political theater. It was enough to bring it to the attention of people. It was enough to show these videos and to impeach him a second time. But in the end, and, you know, Chris Coons, I, I, I've not had a problem with him in the past, but we're now seeing quotes from him. They're like, people in Congress want to get back for Valentine's Day. They want to get back to their families for Valentine's Day. And um, that's a crock of shit. That's a crock of shit. That says that you don't take this seriously, that all of this is theater, that all of this is just going through the rounds and going through the motions, putting on a production, putting on a spectacle. Um, it's on TV. It's something for the people to watch, something for people to get upset about. And that's it. And the Democratic Party, and I talked about this on the muckrake, the Democratic Party saw this as a, a fait accompli, that the Republicans were not going to vote to convict him. And it was enough to simply show the spectacle that they would put him on trial and then they'd get on, get on the other side of it. And we kept hearing these things. And, you know, you saw it in Politico. You saw it in publications. I heard it from people within the Democratic Party. They felt like it was taking away too much attention from Joe Biden's agenda and the Democratic movement towards, I, I, I don't know, whatever in the hell they're planning on doing or whatever legislation they're planning on going with. I, I don't know. I don't know what they're planning on doing. Uh, I think it's craven. And I think it's disgusting. And I am, uh, I, I, I was, I was ashamed of it. I'll be honest. I was ashamed of it. And I watched it happen and it was a sinking feeling. And, you know, I was, I've been working on, uh, American rules going to be coming out in paperback and I needed to do, um, an epilogue to the epilogue, which is, uh, um, you know, it involves the coup, it involves the pandemic and where we are. And I've been working on that, trying to put that together. And, you know, it, it, for American rule, the whole point was we need to relearn American history, understand that reality is not the way that we have thought it was. And we need to recognize that in a hurry and we need to act accordingly. And we're only one step further on the rung of this crisis. And I was writing about how, you know, now more than ever, people needed to understand what was actually going on. And we needed to to move beyond political theater and these metaphorical victories that the Democratic Party puts on their shelves like so many participation trophies. And I was so disgusted by it. And revolted by it. And I have to tell you, um, I, I, I hold back when it comes to the Democratic Party sometimes. Like, I've been talking about their history. I've been talking about what they do um, and, and, and how they've changed in the past few decades. And I hold back a little bit because I, there, there is an optimistic, romantic part of me that wants to believe that suddenly they will come to their senses and they will act responsibly and accordingly and meet the times. Uh, we're in a moment of crisis. We're facing a fascistic movement. On top of that, we have a, a, a global pandemic that we are failing every single day. We have a climate catastrophe, which uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but every single day brings new evidence of it. We all know where this thing is going. Everybody knows it's real, but nobody wants to stand up and do the right thing or call it what it is. Because, my God, that would make good optics. That would make good messaging. We have a party that knows that we're on the precipice of real dangerous things. And they will occasionally call it out. But that's about it. 
and I'm frustrated and I'm pissed off. And I want to believe, and I've wanted to believe for a while because people, people reach out to me a lot and they say, do you think that the democratic party is salvageable? And I have thought for a very long time that the Democratic Party is salvageable. There are people within the party that are very, very good and, and they have good priorities. And I think I think this next generation up knows what they're doing. And I think that they are very passionate and I think that they they approach these things in all the right ways. Right now, it feels very tenuous. It feels like there are these growing crises and they're not meeting the challenge and they're not meeting the moment. And I keep saying, and I want to be very, very clear, this isn't a both sides type of thing. The Republican Party is a fascistic, anti-democratic movement. The Democratic Party is a center-right, center, occasionally center-left party that has been drugged to the right in the last few years and it has been primarily a market-based free trade party. That is what they have been over the past few decades. It needs to change and it needs to change soon. And I am, I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what that means. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what I think that that should look like or how that can work. And one of the reasons is because um, I've been thinking about what social media does and how it works and how it keeps us often from figuring out problems. And I want to talk more about that in a second. But I want to say before I start talking about social media and trying to figure out this problem and the future, I just want to say that I, I was actually really encouraged that when I looked on social media in the in the midst of the uh, the acquittal, that a lot of people in the past who I don't think would have openly criticized the Democratic Party um, were frothing at the mouth and calling it out for what it was, which was a capitulation and just an absolute folding of epic, unbelievable proportions. I was really, really. I was emboldened by that, I'll be honest with you. But I do have to say that one of the reasons why I didn't respond to it, and one of the reasons why I sort of stayed away from the discourse is because I noticed very, very quickly one of the things that was happening on Twitter with the Democrats capitulating. And what I noticed was this, is that there were a group of people who I have oftentimes talked about as guardians of the status quo. Uh, and these are people who, um, you know, they traffic in memes, they traffic in slogans, they talk about how, you know, electing the right Democrat is going to change everything. And, and sometimes, honest to God, it follows the same trajectory of wish fulfillment that the right has been going with. On one hand, the right talks about how, oh, don't worry, there's a plan, there's going to be a military coup, the military is going to take over, Donald Trump actually won the presidency, he's going to get sworn, he's going to get sworn back in in March, don't worry about it. It's not the same thing. And again, this isn't both sides. On the, not even the left, but sort of the liberal part of social media, there are those that the moment that you criticize the Democratic Party, who, by the way, are comprised of people, human beings who do the right thing and often do the wrong thing, that if you criticize them, shut up and trust the plan. Oh, you just don't understand politics. They're actually playing three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional chess. Tell me that that doesn't sound familiar. Tell me that that isn't the exact same damn thing that people said about Donald Trump. It's the same fucking song and dance. You just don't understand. You're, you're not smart enough to understand. You're not in those meanings. You don't get it. Leave it to the experts. 
Trust Schumer, trust Pelosi, trust the leadership. You know what I saw out of leadership? Capitulation. You know what I saw out of leadership? And I'll be honest, I saw a person in charge of this entire process who didn't know what was going on half the time. Yeah, that's the thing. And then I turn on MSNBC and I see Claire McCaskill, who gets on TV and is like, you got to think about the independent voter, who is a white person like Claire McCaskill who never put her neck out on the line for anything. I am tired as hell of this bullshit. I'm tired of people treating the Democratic Party like it's some sort of a purging body where if you question what they do once, oh my God, you must be a bigot. Oh my God, I bet you're a Republican. I bet you're a Trump voter. That's bullshit. This dichotomy between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is destructive. On one side, they worship Donald Trump. And on the other side, if you don't say the right thing, if you don't deal with something the right way, if you, oh my God, if you question Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, oh my God, don't you know that she ripped up Trump's speech, the State of the Union? That's insanity. I'm sorry, but that is not a mature vision of politics. These are human beings. They do the right thing, and sometimes they do the wrong thing. That's madness. And I have to tell you, and, and listen, I'm just going to call her out by name at this point. It's like Terry Canefield. Terry Canefield is educated QAnon for the left. Trust the plan. How could you possibly ever question the Democratic Party? Oh, my God. When we had her on the podcast... We had a conversation about what the Democratic Party was before we ever got on the air. And she was like, I think the Democratic Party is absolutely a representation of its voters. That's not true. That's not how political parties work, particularly in a dichotomous political system. They are not perfect. And no amount of memes of what Michelle Obama wore to the inauguration and, and fights over whether you call Jill Biden doctor or not, none of those conversations are going to change the material conditions of how people live. It doesn't mean that you can't support Michelle Obama. It doesn't mean that you can't support Dr. Jill Biden. And by the way, she should be called doctor. She earned the degree. She should be called doctor. But that is not what we're talking about. I want a party that will stand up for what is right and stand up to fascist fucking coup attempts. Democratic Party is not perfect and the Democratic Party is not evil. It's a party. The Republican Party is not even a party anymore. It's a fascistic movement. They have no principles. Democratic principles, they vary. Mostly, it's socially liberal. Fiscally, it's free markets and letting the market decide. They are completely agreed on economic decisions. One of them is crueler than the other. But starting in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when Bill Clinton, Al Fromm, and the Democratic Leadership Council, and by the way, this also involved Joe Biden, moved to the right. That doesn't mean that Joe Biden is evil. It doesn't mean that he's a terrible human being. It doesn't mean that I won't support him when he does good things. But I'm sorry, Joe Biden was one of the architects of mass incarceration and this current police state. And he did it, like other Democrats, in order to seem hard on crime. That's not tinfoil hat bullshit. That's what happened. That's what actually took place in the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. It is not tinfoil hat bullshit to sit here and talk about how Hillary Clinton made one of her major platforms against gay marriage, or that she voted for the Iraq war. These are true things. The Democratic Party is not perfect, and the Democratic Party is not evil. But I have to tell you that the country was not healed in totality when Joe Biden was elected president of the United States of America. He's actually been further left as president than I expected him to be. But that doesn't mean that everything is peaches and cream. It's not. I got online and I started watching these people telling people to shut up and that they can't criticize the Democratic Party. And I have to tell you that that sort of weird, 
that sort of weird political pressure and social pressure is not okay. There's no way that this party gets better or that our politics get better if what happens is politics turns into orthodoxy. It's not okay. Social media, and I'm having a rough go with this, and I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, and I'm trying to come up with ideas, and I don't yet know what to do yet, but I want to talk. I'm so glad that you all came out tonight. I thought maybe it'd be me and, I don't know, maybe a relative or whatever. You know, I got my start, I got my platform on Twitter because I was reporting live from Trump rallies. I didn't expect it. It just kind of happened. The next thing I know, I have Twitter. And the next thing I know, I have to figure out what to do with some sort of a platform on Twitter. I've tried to use it to educate. I've tried to use it to bring about information that I'm finding in my research to bring it to people. I'm trying to see change. I'm trying to get people to understand what has happened. And then that way, maybe it will reframe what it, what is going on and maybe, maybe help people understand why things feel so weird and why like the politics that we all absorb doesn't feel real or tangible or like there's anything that we can do with it. That's what I've been trying to use Twitter for. But I have to tell you a couple of things about Twitter. Twitter, first and foremost, is an internet forum. I grew up on internet forums. I used, I, I, one of the first things I did on the internet was I joined an internet forum back when I was like 15 or 16. It was a window into another world. I met a ton of people who were like me in a small town. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of those people. I was able to find a lot of different people and have different conversations. But I have to tell you that forums are toxic. There are power plays constantly. One of the currencies of forums, including Twitter, is detached irony. It's pretending like you don't really care about anything. And people who do care are fucking lame. Tell me if that sounds familiar. Twitter's where a bunch of people go to get their rocks off, just like dunking on each other and making fun of other people. And by the way, it's just like elementary school, uh, junior high or high school, which is where, for whatever reason, somebody just picks on somebody to, you know, pick on. And suddenly that person's an outsider and they just kick them around for years. For years. I'm not going to get totally into that. I've been watching some stuff on Twitter for the past couple of weeks and past couple of months and past couple of years that I think are not only toxic, they're abusive. I'm tired of it. I'm really, really tired of it. And I'm tired of watching people get abused on there. It sucks, first and foremost. Second of all, Twitter is a commodified reality. There's a reason we're only allowed X number of characters. Okay, so first and foremost, it's so we can have conversations with each other, but it keeps you from being able to communi communicate in entirety. Which, by the way, I have to tell you, as somebody who's trying to talk about these things on Twitter, every other tweet most of the time is like, we didn't mention this. What about this? It's like, yeah, I'd probably mention that in another thing. It promotes miscommunication. It promotes an inability to actually communicate with other people. It actually hampers idea sharing. It actually really, really hurts our ability to talk to one another. Meanwhile, we're all competing over followers, likes, retweets. It is a commodified capitalistic reality. It's not great. It's the best thing that I've got right now in my ability to get my information out. But it sucks. And watching it become an oppressive, abusive universe sucks. Really, really sucks. I keep saying when we talk on here that we got to realize that something like a Twitter is what it is. And giving airspace to Marjorie Taylor Greene, Josh Howley, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, any number of these people... You are building them into new Trumps. Not you, but everybody. They're building them into new Trumps. So like whenever Marjorie Taylor Greene says something awful and offensive and outrageous, when people retweet her or go after her, all it does is it builds her outreach. 
it blows hot air into an ever growing balloon. It's the same thing with Trump. Trump didn't just appear. I keep saying it. I keep saying it. And Trump is a symptom. He's not the disease. And we we helped create him. That's a hard thing, and I'll say it again. We helped create Donald Trump as president of the United States, even if we disagree with him. We let him capture our imagination. We let his particular brand of spectacle capture our imagination. We let him take over cable news. We let him take over Twitter. We let him take over our ideas and our ability to think and move and interact with one another. I watched back in, back before the pandemic where we were hanging out with other people or you're out in public. I noticed it over and over and over again where his words and his linguistics started slipping into other people's conversations. People were just doing impressions of him constantly. When they would talk about things, they would say the best people, strongly, shithole, any number of things that Trump would say. He infected us. We're letting it happen again. And I keep trying to tell people it's going to get worse. And it's not going to be Trump. It's going to be somebody else. It's going to be somebody else. It's going to be worse. If we don't get this thing under control, it's going to get bad. It's going to get really, really bad. So I don't know. I don't know yet what I, and I've only been thinking about this for a couple. I mean, the, the things I'm talking about, I've been thinking about for a while. But I don't know what it's going to come to. I don't know what it's going to turn into in terms of my thought or what I'm going to do. I know that we have to change the way that we use social media. I know that first and foremost. I don't know if this is a thing where we need to figure out a way to move the Democratic Party left or I, not even left, like into reality. I don't know if, if dealing with the Democratic Party in some way. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be uh, some media opportunity i don't know yet i don't know yet what form this is going to take i do know this i appreciate all of you and i appreciate the listeners of the muckrake and the muckrake community um it's a really really beautiful little community where i've seen people take care of each other and i've seen a lot of affection between people um if you're looking for something that's better, I would go look at it. I would go look at it. I think that that's a start. And I don't know what that means, and I don't know where that goes, and I don't know what we can do. But I just keep coming around to the idea that there has to be something better. And there has to be something beyond something like Twitter or social media or cable news that limits our ability to imagine things. I don't know what that is. I don't know. I, I and, and part of the reason is because this political environment and this political economy and this political reality keeps us from imagining alternatives. And one of the things it does is if you do come up with an alternative or you do come up with a threat to capitalism or this political environment, it'll take what you do. It'll either destroy it or it will absorb it and defang it and make it part of itself. I don't know what the answer is. I know I'm going to take a couple of days off Twitter and I'm going to do it to see how it feels. I'm going to do it to see what it does to my thinking. And also because I, I don't want to get on Twitter and just like fight with people. I don't think that does anything. And on top of that, like, I don't want to, it's just, just flame wars. For anybody who's ever been on a forum, it's just flame wars. I have no desire. And I, and, and I think some of you have seen me do this in the past because I've talked about it and I think you've mentioned it. I try not to go after people. I try not to get in like battles with people on Twitter. And when I find myself doing it, I'm like, no, just go ahead and delete that and move on. I don't want to do that. 
And this is such a weird, toxic moment where the people who want to gatekeep for the status quo and gatekeep for the Democratic Party, it's obvious that they are so lost in their reality or in their own perspective that it's it's not even worth it. I, I, it's, not, it's not even worth it. It's not worth getting on there and fighting with people. And I don't think I could log on to Twitter right now and not just get in one fight after another with people and have them, well, you just, you just don't understand. Like, you, this isn't a realistic take on politics. Like, there's so many different movements and so many different ideas. And you just have to, you just have to be more realistic. And that's just not how things work. And meanwhile, all they do is they take the oxygen out of any conversation or any sort of idea that could possibly change what's happening. They defame you. They keep you from being able to participate in a meaningful way that can actually change things. And I'm, I'm pissed. I'm pissed. I'm really, really pissed off and I'm tired. I knew that it was going to suck when he got acquitted. Like, I knew that was going to suck. Like, it was just not going to feel good. But watching it happen, watching the Republican Party do this, and watching the Democratic Party fold, and then watching just the hordes of supporters. Trust the plan. Do you not understand politics? Are you not smart enough to understand the plan? The plan? I'm tired of it. I'm really, really tired of it. And I want things to get better. I want things to get better. Just a little bit better. I want people to have better lives. I, I want people to be able to get health care. I want people to not have to work like a half a dozen gig jobs and not get health care and not get anything nearing security. I don't want people drowning in debt. I, I, we, we supposedly live in the richest fucking country in the world and we can't even do that. That's nuts. It's absolutely nuts what is happening. And meanwhile, as this entire illusion of normalcy, unity and normal, meanwhile, that none of it's, we're not united, we're not normal. None of this is normal. The wealthy and the powerful are using the illusion of normalcy to continue to hollow out government and society as we know it. We want to destroy liberal democracy. Who do you think was funding these people at the Capitol? Who do you think is always giving Trump and the Republican Party all of their money? It's the wealthy and the powerful. They've got some dogs on the chain. That's what this is. It's not nuts to think that people deserve a place to live, that they deserve health care, and that they deserve to live better, healthier lives. It's not nuts. It's not, it's not unrealistic. It's not even romantic. It's baseline human decency. We could get romantic. We could talk about big, giant ideas and projects and what a different society would look like. I'm talking about base-level human fucking decency it sucks really really sucks <sighs> so <sighs> appreciate you letting me rant for a little while uh, we're going to take next week off from bourbon talks I'm going to um, I'm going to take a couple days off think about this stuff and figure out what I think are some solutions I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I got ideas, but I just don't know yet. I got to figure out some alternatives. I got to figure out. I got to figure out what a decent move is. I don't know if it's getting a bunch of people in the same place in terms of like a network or a site, or if it's about figuring out a way to take like the muckrake community and turn it into some sort of like a more focused kind of thing while still being there for each other. I don't know. I don't know what it is or like figuring out a different way to use Twitter or a different way to approach Twitter where all of a sudden it's not what it is. I'm not sure yet. 
I appreciate you coming along. I appreciate your kindness. Um, you know, yesterday I posted, it was like 6 p.m. or something. I posted that I was going to take some time off of Twitter. And I just had um, so many sweet people like reach out and ask if I was doing okay. And uh, it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. Yeah, I do. I need to get more involved with the Muckrake Discord channel. There's a lot going on. It, like, Discord's a lot. But I need to I need to get better with it. I think that's right, too. That'll be nice. I'll probably use Discord more and figure out what I'm going to do with Twitter and how I'm going to use it. I think the Lincoln Project is being exposed for what it's been all along. I'll leave it at that. I think it's being exposed for what it was from the very beginning. I was talking about that for a while, but it's not great. Yeah, I don't think I have to build a big thing, but I got to figure out a way to um, focus energy and focus energy and focus focus. I got to figure out something there while also being healthy and good for myself and other people. But I really appreciate everybody. There's a lot of kindness, and I always feel a lot of kindness. And even when it starts to feel bad, and even as it starts to feel um, like yesterday felt hopeless in a really bizarre way that I didn't expect it to. Um, but when it does, um, your kindnesses help. I mean that. And I, uh, again, I, I mean this when I say it, like watching watching you all be kind to one another and watching people in the Muckrake community be kind to one another um, is inspiring. And it makes me think about what grassroots movement and grassroots solidarity and care and love can do. And so I thank you all so, so much. Um, like I said, I'm going to take next week off from Bourbon Talk. I'll be back on uh, the 28th. February is almost done. I'll be back on the 28th. I'll be taking questions, stuff like that. Uh, and meanwhile, I'm going to take a couple days off Twitter and think about what I think about it and what I want to do and how I want to use it. And uh, I think I'll still use it, but I got to figure out how I approach it and uh, how I'm going to sort of block out the worst stuff. Yeah. Here's to everybody. Thank you all so much. We'll talk soon.